All right, well, welcome uh, to our current session of Conversations on Europe, uh, which our focus today is Croatia's path to European Union, the next member state. Um, my name is Andrew Konitzer. I'm the Associate Director for Russian East European Studies here at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, I'll be moderating the event and also be probably participating in, in certain functions along the way. Um, I'd like to introduce everybody first around the table here. We've got an international group of specialists, both here virtually and, and, and factually, I guess, um, who focus on topics <laughs> such as the European Union, EU enlargement, uh, former Yugoslavia, and the uh, international political economy of Europe. Um, first, I'd like to um, introduce you to uh, Natasha Beshirevich who is a professor of political science at the University of Zagreb and a visiting scholar at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, professor Beshirevich uh, has served on a delegation of the European Union to Croatia and has written extensively on the EU accession process in Croatia and the Western Balkans. And I'm not sure where she's appearing on your screen, but uh, there she is at the bottom right hand corner of Good Mars. Good morning. Uh, we also have, I think, or she's soon on her, her way. Well, let me skip down just in case she comes while I'm doing the introductions and instead introduce the person to my left. <laughs> um, Director of uh, Center for Russian East European Studies and Professor of Anthropology, Robert Hayden. Um, in addition to his work on <clears throat> India and his current global project on competitive, sh competitive sharing of religious sites, uh, Dr. Hayden has conducted extensive research on the states of the former Yugoslavia and has overseen several major development and exchange programs devoted to the region. So we're very pleased to have him here in Pittsburgh with us today. Um, Hi, Candy. Good morning, everybody. Morning. We also then have at the middle bottom of our screen, um, <laughs> Dominique Volksdorf, uh, who is senior associate uh, researcher at the uh, Ria University in Brussels and is currently a TAPIR, I'm not going to assume they say Tapir, but I'll put it down there anyway, uh, fellow uh, from the Center for Transatlantic Relations at the Paul H. Nietzsche School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, Mr. Topdorf has published widely on the topic of EU conditionality in the Western Balkans, and we're very pleased to have him here to share his thoughts on Croatia's accession um, today. Is Laura there yet? Yep. Hi, Laura. Okay, we have found Laura. Uh, then I'll introduce Laura Hastings, uh, who's with our group there in the University of Illinois at uh, Urbana-Champaign. Uh, Laura, is, Dr. Hastings is a lecturer in political science and interim director of the Global Studies uh, degree. Uh, she's a specialist on international political economy, uh, was listed publications and projects, spans <coughs> economies and political systems in South America, Europe, the former Soviet Union, and Africa. So we're very pleased to have her with us uh, for today's discussion as well. Um, a little bit of housekeeping here before we get started. Uh, please do keep in mind that this is being videotaped, so we all have to behave ourselves as much as possible. Um, and also, for this to work best, uh, I want to ask you to please mute your microphones uh, until someone there is ready to speak. Otherwise, we're going to have people sort of jumping at us uh, through the screens every time somebody clears their throat or there's some sort of loud background noise, etc. Um, and to get started, uh, before our discussion, um, I distributed a list of questions to each of the participants that are here uh, today. And um, we're going to be going over some of these questions. I'll be sort of quickly providing you an overview for them after this brief description. But sort of with the expectation that there may be um, a number of people in the audience that haven't been following uh, Croatia's um, path to the European Union um, or following affairs in Croatia since uh, the state's independence in 1991. Um, I wanted to walk through just a brief history, sort of touching the high points here and understanding that having said brief history here, I'm also opening up uh, potential for a lot of controversy in terms of things that I'm going to mention and things that I am going to skip over. So um, let's keep that in mind. If there's anything that comes out of the uh, history here that I'm going to provide, we of course can certainly discuss that in the course of uh, the discussion um, for the remainder of the, the time here. So I just wanted to point out that uh, Javoin Budavalchi was calling me on Skype, so let me turn that off. <laughs> All right, a review of rather limited literature on Croatia's accession effort. 
uh, reveals such titles as Croatia's EU referendum, an anatomy of a belated parentheses non-success. Uh, Croatia and European Union, a long delayed journey, and Croatia's rocky road toward the European Union. Young. Uh, recapping this roughly 20 years between Croatia's appearance as an independent state uh, and its pending accession to the European Union, one can certainly appreciate perhaps the tone um, embo embodied in such titles. Uh, to borrow a phrase from Marx's Tanner, uh, Croatia was indeed a nation that was very recently forged in war. Um, its exit from the former Soviet Union under the leadership of President Franjo Tudjman was accompanied by an uprising in the self-proclaimed Serbian Republic of Krajina, and also a full-scale land, air, and even sea war with the forces of the Yugoslav People's Army. While full-scale military operations were curtailed in early 1992 under a UN-broke peace deal, nearly one-third of the territory of the newly independent Croatia remained under separatist control. Periodic violence continued in 1990, until 1995 when the Croatian government mounted two major military operations, Flash and Storm. In the course of these two operations, roughly 200,000 Serbs fled Croatia, thus accounting for nearly one quarter of the 950,000 total refugees and IDPs, uh, which Mikic estimated were created in the course of this four to five year conflict. The war also produced its share of war crimes and the arrest and extradition of associate suspects would provide a major sticking point in Croatia's future relations with the European Union. After a full cessation of hostilities wrought by Operations Flash and Storm, Tujman and the ruling HDZ faced a new chapter in the country's political history. With the legitimacy preferred by the country's war footing gone, the government resorted increasingly to corruption, clientelism, and semi-authoritarian practices. These factors, as well as the regime's defiance on the issue of regime return or refugee return, and a cooperation with the International Criminal Tribunal of Yugoslavia, or ICTI for short, uh, contributed to an increasing state of international isolation, which only further inhibited Croatia's stalled efforts to rebuild its economy. Now, in the 1999 to 2000 election cycle, the death of Tujman, internal party divisions, international pressure, and the united opposition combined to defeat the HDZ and open uh, what looked to be a new era in Croatian politics. Uh, but the new SDP-led coalition under Ivica uh, Rachan quickly ran into trouble. Croatia's economic challenges proved more resistant than the new coalition had initially hoped. To make matters worse, Western pressure to comply with ICTI and take steps to facilitate refugee return placed the government in a conflict with a highly mobilized collection of veterans and other right-wing organizations, which were politically tied to a recovery HDZ. Although the Rachan government constituted a break with increasingly authoritarian trends in Croatia and made some progress in rebuilding the Croatian economy and moving the, the country closer to the European Union, the accomplishment certainly fell far short of the admittedly unrealistic expectations of the coalition's early days. So combined pressures eventually split the coalition, and after briefly reconstituting itself, the government essentially limped to the end of its mandate and was defeated by the HDZ, which returned to power thus four years after um, it was initially ousted in 2000. However, the HDZ that returned to power in 2003 was quite different, at least in terms of the, in the eyes of the Western international community. Uh, for the past three years, the post tujman president, Ivo Sanader, carefully marginalized vocal hardline elements within the party and cultivated a new European image. The HDZ's apparent change of heart on the refugee issue and the ICTI issue and its stridently pro-European rhetoric helped Croatia establish Miladova Chudova's coveted European consensus within Croatia. Now, the rest of the story is perhaps less dramatic, but still replete with challenges. Under two consecutive HDZ governments, Croatia experienced steady economic growth through 2008, arrested its last AD war crime suspects, put the refugee issue to rest. Um, they didn't say that it was actually resolved, but it was no longer going to be considered a major issue for the international community, and completed the remaining steps towards EU membership. However, continued to struggle with crime and corruption, best exemplified in former Prime Minister and HDZ President Sadatar's arrest and sentencing to 10 years in prison for corruption. 2008 also spell, spelled the end of economic growth in the country, and substantial debt and high unemployment continue to cloud Croatia's future. I should also mention that in the course of the secession process during the 2000s, Croatians had also become some of the most Eurosceptic citizens in Europe. In many respects, Croatia represents the future of EU expansion. Countries to its south and east hoping to gain entrance bring challenges and historical baggage that are arguably greater than even Croatia's. 
Thus, while Croatia's entrance into the EU is probably cause for celebration, the path that followed raises questions about the effectiveness of conditionality, the tangible benefits of EU membership, and the feasibility of future expansion in this complex region of Europe. And I suspect that our panelists today are going to provide us with some uh, interesting insights into these and other <coughs> questions. So following up that sort of brief um, sort of historical introduction, uh, I'll again remind everybody who has joined us today that I gave out a list of questions. Um, I'm not going to read them in their entirety because the questions themselves are rather long. Um, but that we'll be sort of working with these as, as a beginning point, a starting point for our discussion. Um, so the questions just briefly in terms of, of, of general areas we're going to touch on. We're going to talk about whether the EU is good for Croatia, essentially, whether Croatia is good for the EU. Um, and also look at some more interesting neighborhood questions that have arisen uh, in the course of um, the, the process of Croatia's um, membership um, session. And so to sort of kick things off, and not wanting to confuse the people who are, are here as our discussions too much, I'm actually going to jump to the last question in the list. Um, and it'll essentially get us into uh, the issue of, you know, are we here today for the right reason? Um, there have been reports recently in uh, Croatian and the European press, okay. some of us even got here in the United yeah. States. Wow. Hello. Hello. Yes. Yes. So okay, welcome to Washington. Yes. All right, well, so the University of Washington has now joined us. Yes, good morning. Good. Yeah. So to restart here, um, the question that I was going to uh, raise for my first question for our panelists. Um, recent reports in Croatia and in the foreign uh, media outlets have actually raised questions about whether or not Croatia will indeed make the July 1st, uh, 2013 um, expected accession date. And a number of important countries in Europe have indeed failed to ratify Croatia's membership uh, so far. So I wanted to ask uh, those who are on the table, and maybe I'm going to start with uh, asking uh, Dr. Or Professor Vesirevich uh, this question. Um, how realistic uh, are these concerns about a delayed uh, accession? Um, are there potential problems that would cause the accession to occur <laughs> after July 1st, if at all? Okay, um, let me be completely clear about this question. Um, we are uh, quite sure that uh, Croatia will join European Union on July 1st. And um, regarding those important member states, uh, basically they are waiting for a monitoring report. As you might know, Croatia is still under monitoring for important chapters, uh, primarily on jurisdiction and uh, human rights. And they are basically waiting for that monitoring report. But there are all um, emphases that uh, they would uh, ratify the session. As you know, a session, a session treaty should be ratified in all member states' parliament, and that wouldn't be a problem. Uh, to be quite honest, the main problem should be Slovenia, because during that accession process, uh, they have used uh, bilateral issues to be solved through that accession process, and the main emphasis in relation with Slovenia is so-called Ljubljana Bank. Um, as you might know, Ljubljana Bank was uh, one of the three largest uh, banks in former Yugoslavia, but after breaking up of Yugoslavia, um, Slovenian political elite just adopted a decision by which uh, account holders who are not citizens of Slovenia cannot get their money until the end of Yugoslavia's uh, session, and approximately uh, 130,000 Croatian citizens uh, had their savings in Ljubljana Bank, and uh, these funds were never returned. Um, as as consequence, um, Croatian citizens have started with uh, processes against Ljubljana Bank, and now uh, we are talking about uh, hundreds of millions of euros uh, that should be funded from the side of the state for Croatian citizens. And now we have political um, political um, impact of Slovenian political elites that, that these um, these uh, court uh, processes should be stopped in order to ratify the uh, Croatian assess, accession uh, treaty. 
and that is the main issue uh, regarding um, regarding Slovenia and the Croatia that Ljubljana Bank came. And I think that uh, it should be case until the last day before a session, but I strongly believe that European Commission will not let, of course, they are not um, official measures how bilateral uh, bilateral relations can be uh, uh, can be stopped, but uh, by peer pressure from other member states, European Commission would not let that uh, Slovenian bilateral issues would stop creation accession. Um, creation accession is very important process for European for European Union, and uh, just as illustration, uh, we um, Croatia in Croatia we have already appointed EU Commissioner for EU. Uh, for EU Commission. So uh, basically, I don't think that there would be any obstacle. Um, oops, sorry, problem with connection. There wouldn't be really any obstacle for stopping EU accession process of Croatia entering on that exact day. Okay. Um, any other panelists wants to comment on that question or anything that um, uh, Professor Beshevich has said? Okay. Well, while we're on the topic then of, I guess, good neighborly relations, um, let me move to another question that I had sent out to the panelists. Um, and this focused on the relationship between Croatia and Serbia. Um, now, in the past, well, let's call it a uh, year or so, uh, basically since the, the Serbian elections in May, uh, and then followed closely by the uh, decision by the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia to acquit uh, Ante Gotovina and Lajan uh, Markic. Um, relations between uh, Croatia and Serbia after many years of improvement. In fact, um, former President Josipa, or not former President, excuse me, former President Tadic and current Croatian President Josipovic are recently um, given a, a, a medal for their improvements in relations between the two countries. Um, but since the elections and, and these other events that I just uh, mentioned, uh, there's been some concern about uh, worsening relations or at least a, a cooling of relations between um, Serbia and Croatia. So in the um, interest of one of the EU's conditions, which is to maintain good neighborly relations uh, within the region, um, what are the prospects for um, Serbo-Croatian relations um, looking down the road and, and would they have any appreciable impact on uh, the European Union, one, and Serbia's um, efforts to get into the European Union. Question four. Um, I'll leave that open to any of the panelists who want it. Okay. Maybe maybe I can start with, with, with that answer, with my opinion. Um, I, I don't think that there will be any um, problem with um, <coughs> between um, Serbia and Croatia. Um, ICTY issue is definitely highly emotional, uh, highly emotional, um, highly ranked uh, agenda in, in the political system of Croatia and Serbia. And um, these unlucky and these rough sentences from uh, President Nikolic, I think they were uh, basically motivated by some internal Serbian uh, political games. But afterwards, as you might as you might know, we had a meeting of two prime ministers, and basically on a everyday technical level between ministries, between governments, cooperation is um, on high standard. And I think that in future months uh, there will be. A meeting between uh, two presidents of Croatia and Serbia, and things will continue as they have uh, before, uh, and they were pretty satisfied from both, from both sides. So I, I think that was really a political moment for President uh, Nikolic, who was not really hmm, who was not really uh, dealing well well with that, with that issue. Uh, but I think that after after passions have uh, have just went away, that cooperation would continue as it was before on very satisfied level. That would be my opinion. And be, between Croatia and Serbia, that relation will not influence a session process of Serbia. And uh, on the other hand, Croatia is not allowed under its um, accession treaty. Croatia is not allowed to um, settle the, their bilateral issues with, 
with any accession country in the future, like that was the case between Slovenia and Croatia. So that, that is my question. That is my opinion. In other words, uh, in other words, Croatia will not be permitted to act like Slovenia. So exactly. I, I, I agree with Professor uh, Bashirovic uh, in, in regard to relations. The, the meeting between the prime ministers was three days ago, two days ago, and the Croatian prime minister went to Serbia and met with the Serbian prime minister. And just the two of them, there was no protocol, there was no pomp, uh, there was no, there were no even even advisors. Uh, the, the major difficulty has been exactly as you say with, with Nikolic, it's primarily symbolic. Um, the only thing I disagree with what Professor Vashirovic said was that um, I don't think Nikolic was um, reacting particularly to uh, uh, political motivation. I think he actually said what he believed, which is strange. They, uh, politicians in that part of the world tend not to be as professional as ours. Sometimes they say things they actually believe, and our politicians find that actually hard to believe that they would do that. But they, there are certain uh, of the symbolic issues. The ICTY is one of them. The events of uh, uh, Olivia Operation Storm in 1995 is another. There will simply not be agreement between Serbian public opinion and thus Serbian politics and Croatian public opinion and thus Croatian politics on the issue. It simply will not happen. And if anyone thinks that, uh, you know, your AU conditionality or any other uh, form of conditionality is going to bring about some kind of rapprochement on those issues, they're wrong. Um, those types of issues don't get settled for, for many, many years. I remind the Americans in the audience that um, we hear the Marine hymn, which refers to the falls of Montezuma. That would be the American invasion of Mexico in 1842, and if uh, you go to Mexico City, you will see the monument to the Mexican soldiers killed in their heroic defense of Mexico from the Americans in 1852. American and, um, and, and, and Mexican opinion on that war has not been settled after 100, uh, more than 170 years. Um, neither do the Americans and Canadians uh, share a common view on what we call the War of 1812. So um, I think if we get by the symbolic uh, uh, issues, there's actually not much problem between Serbia and Croatia. There really aren't issues. Uh, Professor uh, Tolksdorf is somebody who has um, done a great deal of research throughout the region and has been focused on the conditionality questions. What do you see, um, you know, coming off of this discussion as sort of a driving? Well, what do you see first as the as the future for, uh, as we refer to as good neighborly relations or otherwise uh, in the region, and and what is the driving factor behind that trend? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, I would say. I mean, the, the whole thing didn't really start well with Nikolic in this interview, I think, uh, in this uh, newspaper interview. The whole relationship didn't really start well. But I, I think, like, the relations might like, improve in the next next month. I, I think, like, it really depends on the politicians themselves. But also, like, on, on some factors, uh, for example, like, how the, uh, the Serb population in Croatia is integrated. It's still, like, one of the topics. Um, that might still be discussed, even though Croatia is already part of the European Union. Um, but then also, like other other factors that are invo involved in this kind of uh, relationship, um, such as like um, the relationship uh, of the relations, Croatia's relations with Bosnia. I think they are also a factor in the relationship with Serbia, because I think like Nikolic uh, um, is still looking also at. at Bosnia, it's not only on, on, on Croatia. So how the relationship between like the whole regional cooperation thing will develop in the, in the next month that will be um, kind of important in, in, in this kind of neighborly relations as well. But one, one thing which, which seems to be clear from the European side is like that um, the European Union doesn't want to import another new Greece into the European Union. That is like a country which is blocking the membership of another country which is not yet part of the European Union, such as Greece is doing in its relations with Macedonia. So here, I think the European Union will really look at how Croatia handles the relations with Serbia and Bosnia in the, in the next years, um, and really focus on this kind of regional cooperation. 
and hoping really that the Croatian government does everything in order to assist the other countries of the region uh, to, to come closer to the European Union and eventually join the European Union. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I think that's all for me for now. Thank you. Hi, the Laura Hastings here. Hi, Laura. Hi. Um, not to sound trite, uh, but uh, the conversation, it seems like we want to recognize that the European Union here, um, the actual enlargement instruments can provide a certain amount of dynamism to create a closer regional cooperation. I know that I sound like I'm an EU mouthpiece here, but um, there, is a, there is a role here, actual... Uh, actually in you know creating exchange the U the EU has a history of exchanging student programs uh, creating a kind of regional consciousness Scandinavian countries have done it and the visa grad countries do, do it so there is a, uh, a history here where these uh, this enlargement bringing into the EU can actually create greater regional economic integration because what we haven't mentioned yet is that these countries don't trade with each other very much. The Balkan countries don't have, look at, think of the infrastructure, think of those roads, the way the roads are built there. It's not easy for these countries to engage in trade. So the EU could protect, potentially provide cross-border trade infrastructure as well as other programs. Thanks. Okay. Uh, may I? Yeah, um, Hi, Laura. Uh, nice to see you. Um, the EU doesn't seem to do that anymore. I mean, when Portugal went into the EU, they got a heck of a nice road system, um, but the Bulgarians didn't, and the Romanians didn't. I mean, the Croats have built a nice road system, but they had to do it by themselves. I don't think the EU is in the business of giving out goodies like that anymore. Um, I'm also not sure that I would want to press um, the concept of raising a regional consciousness very much in Zagreb. Um, they, there is still hostility to the idea of, of, of a larger Balkan. They don't want to be Balkan anything, one. And, um, you know, if the region includes or can be perceived as including most of all of the former Yugoslavia, there's kind of an allergy to that as well. So, Bob, hi. <laughs> I'd say that you know the, the, <laughs> I'd say the, um, the prospect of, of money, the prospect of funds is, is currently, I think, making Zagreb slightly uh, more interested in this regional cooperation, at least my interviews there suggest that if they think they're going to be get, getting some regional structural funds, which should be forthcoming, uh, they're, they're interested. And student exchanges, uh, you know, that's, that's a very big program. It's very cost effective. It's not a lot of money. I did see one signpost over in Osiek that said this road is being built by funds from the EU. Um, but that was only, it was only the only one I saw. So I agree with you. They probably aren't giving a lot right now, but there's always hope in the future. Dominique, I think you had your hand raised as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, but I mean, like these funds, uh, they, are, they are getting more and more when you join the European Union, right? So also with the other states in the region, they like the closer they get to the European Union, the funds are increasing. So like if you have a candidate status, that's what it actually means that you get more regional funds, um, pre-accession funds uh, already in this in this step. So like in Croatia, you probably will see in the next month that there's much more money available because like these funds are already made available once the, uh, once Croatia will join join the European Union. Uh, one, one, one point about, um, this is why I raised my hand, one point about um, the trade relations. This is like an, uh, an interesting topic uh, because they will change completely in the region in the next month once uh, Croatia joins the European Union because Croatia will no longer be part of CEFTA, uh, the region um, trade cooperation, and like the whole tariff system will really change, which has a significant impact on the economy in Bosnia and also in Serbia because like the, the products have to be in compliance with EU standards which is a big problem uh, for the agricultural sector in Bosnia at the moment. So they will have to really 
um, yeah, get into the situation that Croatia joins the European Union and the whole trade regime between the states will change. So that would be a really interesting uh, thing that will happen in, in the next years. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any of the other panelists wish you add anything to that? So basically, uh, ju just just a uh, summary of that. Um, in intra-regional uh, trade should uh, will uh, basically uh, decrease due to uh, entering new regime and due to the fact that those um, session those uh, candidate countries would stay in CEFTA. But uh, as it was said that um, EU funds uh, for uh, regional uh, EU projects. Those should be uh, those should be increased uh, uh, in relation between Croatia and 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 um, and neighborhood countries. So uh, EU project EU projects those should be increased. Interregional trade de uh, de decreasing um, in in future future months and years. Okay. Um thinking about where to go with this next, I was seeing two directions, and so I guess I'll go down with this one really quickly um, before I, I go and look at economic issues. It sounds to me that we've got uh, perhaps two different um, ways of approaching the what does the region look like in the future question. Um, one is looking at this as, as sort of trade and economic tie-driven uh, change and, and normalization of relations. Um, and another, I think that based on what, what uh, Dr. Hayden was saying here, is a question about, you know, how deep does this stuff go? Um, can we uh, trade with each other and not like each other? Um, and is that a durable solution looking down the road for the European Union? If we've still got populations that have memories of bad events that happen to each other, but they like to make money in, the, in their exchanges with each other. Uh, is this something that's eventually going to change? Uh, where do we see how, how do, do these sort of rational interest based relationships and ties go? Anybody want to jump on that one? <laughs> Laura, do you see this turning into <laughs> regional uh, change in terms of populations and, and, and people's minds? Is this going to become a, an identity shift for them? Uh, will there be a Europe in the Balkans? Yeah, so having, I mean, I am, I am, um, I'm uncomfortable touting an EU horn because my, my predictions or prognoses are usually pretty pessimistic in that regard. I mean, I do think that, um, that uh, Croatia is really looking forward to what they see are going to be lots of funds available. But I also, um, you know, the privatizing and restructuring of the shipyard and uh, fisheries has been very, very painful. And it's, I'm not sure it's going to end up well. Um, I'm, I'm very concerned about the shipyard industry, which is key for, for Croatia. And this idea that everything has to be privatized and restructured, um, you know, because of EU uh, economic integration issues is, is is problematic. It's going to leave Croatia without a strong uh, national industry, and I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm not happy with that. That's uh, other than that, though. I'm I I don't see a lot of short-term change in the area of, of trade. I think they'll they'll struggle for a long time, sort of in the in the model of other recent accession countries trying to find niches, trying to find some areas where they can compete internationally. Uh, and it's not clear what those are yet. Hmm. Well, uh, ju just if I may add something. Um, yeah, um, tr traditionally, um, all states of former Yugoslavia were basically oriented towards uh, Europe, European Community, European Union. Uh, for example, more than 50% uh, of Croatian trade is basically just focused on on market of European Union, and uh, pretty much was the case with the rest of uh, former Yugoslav states, and um, that's why it was really. Uh, is it possible to, to name uh, that part of Europe region? I mean, region under, under which circumstances? Because 
uh, that uh, level of um, interstate trade was very low even before uh, 1999. Um, that, that is also, also the case. Traditionally, it has been always oriented towards European market. And why would it be changed uh, just because it was one of the conditions of European Union? Um, I'm, not, I'm, not quite sure I, I'm not quite sure I followed. I mean, part of what Croatia's decision to the European Union does is disrupt uh, precisely those trade patterns, right? I mean, you just said that. Uh, when Croatia goes into the European Union, it actually puts up borders to Bosnia, Serbia, uh, you know, Macedonia, Albania, et cetera. So actually Croatia's accession to the European Union sounds counterproductive to the idea of uh, the economic growth of the Balkans. So that's, um, which, which, is kind of, which is kind of interesting if it works out that way. Um, but another issue is, um, you know, the European Union, um, how well is the European Union doing and how well is it going to continue to do? The, uh, Stefan Fille, the, uh, the European Commissioner charged with dealing with the accession countries, said last week that countries that join will have to understand that they're going to be joining a, a radically restructured European Union. Now, he didn't specify what that meant, and uh, I don't know what that means, but um, it I'm sure the Croats hope to get all sorts of economic benefits from joining the European Union, but is this actually likely? Is this actually likely? And if it doesn't happen, then um, some of the undoubted negative economic consequences that that Croatian accession will bring, that Laura Hastings refers to, and that will also arise from the disruption of trade uh, with Serbia primarily, but also with Bosnia, um, may have some rather unfortunate uh, political consequences. And is this being brought into account by the European Union? <laughs> okay. Let me remind the uh, panelists of, of the first question that we had here on the list, which was also related to that, referring back to this often uh, repeated um, quip about uh, Croatia looking like the last guest at the wedding party, showing up, uh, all the wine's gone, the guests are going home. Um, is the party over? Is the party different? Um, what do you have as a response to um, Dr. Hayden's comments? Um, I might also say that I heard that with in Zagreb the day that Croatia's official accession date was given, and immediately the joke in Zagreb was, "This is getting to the party at three o'clock in the morning when the food's all gone, and the wine's all gone, <laughs> you know, the place is a mess, and uh, and, and the band's gone home." Dominique, would you like to take that? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks. Um, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, but I think is this a pessimist? Because like in the European Union, everything's really like kind of structured in a way that it's like on a long-term basis. For example, when it comes, I mean, to be clear, like it's about the EU funds, right? That my, that will increase for for Croatia, which is of course important for for Croatia. And these funds are, are secure as long as uh, Croatia really is the European Union, because these these funds have already been um, earmarked for for Croatia. So this is like something uh, where I would say the the piece is not yet over, uh, but there are still things uh, that Croatia can gain from from um, joining the European Union, and also. Um, like the whole access to the single market. I mean, we have talked about this. This is, of course, like benefit for the uh, Croatian economy, although it has, of course, also really disadvantages uh, because, like, I think this is also why the whole thing, uh, uh, Croatia's accession to the EU is so unpopular often in Croatia because it actually means you take over the whole neoliberal system of the European Union, the whole capitalist system, um, and which means you have to conform with all the competition rules in the European Union and the single market, which are, of course means like the privatization of the shipyards, uh, real estate market, and all these kind of things. So this is of course hard for the population. Um, but in the end, yeah, it's kind of, you have to balance the advantages against the disadvantages. Um, but there's also like maybe this kind of symbolic thing which shouldn't be forgotten here, like that is kind of often like already, a little bit worn out, but like this argument that it's like a, a return to Europe or like the departure from the Balkans, 
which has some kind of symbolic uh, importance still among the population. But I don't know, maybe uh, Natasha uh, should comment on that, how important that is still nowadays, because you could really see like the enthusiasm towards the European Union has really decreased in the last years in Croatia. I would be very interested to see how you assess that uh, from, uh, from a Croatian perspective. Yeah, um, I, I would definitely confirm what you have just said, that primarily uh, one of the main questions of referenda was it is either your Balkans or your Europe. Uh, so on that symbolic level, it is, it is very important question. So finally, we are returning to European civilization after so many years. Uh, but not only that, but regarding EU funds, it is a very doubtful story because if you do not use at least 50% of EU funds, then you should be you should be in trouble. And in so far, in that um, using of EU funds, uh, Croatia did have some um, problems, um, and that would be definitely the issue. For example, if you had um, one billion euro per year, and um, if you need to pay uh, through all kinds of financial uh, lines, if you need to pay at least 60 million euros uh, per year to European budget, and you are not using your funds, then you're in trouble. But I think that uh, what what should be advantage, regarding, uh, regardless of uh, financial banking, economic, political crisis in Europe, is basically that uh, finally in a Croatia there is some kind of harmonization of legislation, set of rules, um, especially in area of agriculture, of public expenditure, of industry, public procurement that was very, uh, very uh, problematic in Croatia. And um, basically, in general, change of political behavior, uh, especially um, for jurisdiction. And in that term, I would say uh, that all corruption, anti-corruption measures were uh, basically um, um, they, they, they were imposed by pressure from uh, European Union level. And without European Union, we wouldn't have uh, that kind of uh, set of, of, of rules uh, uh, in, in Croatia. Hi, Laura Hastings here. I, I, I think this is interesting. I, I just want to make sure to come around to the, the EU, the, the answer to your your, your, your allusion to the fact that the EU has changed. So what we experienced in the last couple of years was a sovereign debt crisis brought on by uh, uh, brought on by eurozone members who were using their membership in the eurozone uh, to to. Uh, and and ha and having independent fiscal policies when in fact they were sharing monetary policy due to their the, the currency the similar currencies so the what what is being alluded to in Europe is there's going to be tighter integration now of fiscal policies as a result of this sovereign debt crisis what is fiscal policy but um, very it's it's state spending and state uh, taxing, which is much more uh, visible to a to a constituency, that's a big change. And so we we want to recognize that the the new EU that Croatia is joining will be one in which public expenditures will be more carefully monitored in the way they weren't before. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't think the party's over if by any means. I think in some ways the EU has reached middle age, and it's sort of Bumbling along, uh, you know, from it, it's you know it's it's not doing well, but it's also not about to go under. Um, but I think Croatia is going to have there is going to be more scrutiny on its fiscal policy. Kind of really boring. Yes, Dominique. Uh, yeah, thank you. Just just a just a quick uh, point which uh, I I found quite interesting. Um, Laura, right? I think uh, you mentioned like this kind of that the EU in the future control the national budgets much more, much tighter, um, which is not yet decided, no, but still on the way. So let's see how the next year's, uh, how, what will be decided on the EU level. But I find this quite interesting because like Croatia is very much used to that already due to the pre-accession process because the national budget, the national <coughs> debts, etc., they have been already controlled quite a lot by the European Commission so far. So for Croatia, this 
won't change at all then uh, from this perspective. That's a sharp remark. Sorry, um, can I ask you, what do you mean by that, that it was controlled by European Commission? Well, not, not directly controlled, but like all these kind of uh, conditions set on Croatia. Also, we're looking at the economic system, right? And how much money is spent on what, etc. That has been quite a lot controlled by the European Union in the last year. So this is actually what I mean, not like a direct control of the national budget. But always like giving recommendations, how to best um, spend your money, uh, mm. what to privatize, etc. This is what. Okay, I mean. indirectly. Okay, thank you. Um, was that indirectly or directly? Actually, I mean, um, it's something. If I can refer to something that you said earlier, Natasha. You said the European Commission will not let Slovenia block Croatian accession. That's a fascinating statement because the European Commission is a bunch of unelected politicians and they're going to tell what's not only a sovereign member state what it can do. And that's rather fascinating, actually. Uh, but that does sound a lot like the European Union. Um, and, and to be only slightly um, uh, ironic, somewhere between irony and, 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 and sarcasm, Croatia at the moment is contemplating membership in a multinational quasi-federation that is an economic crisis with a major debt crisis that's having severe economic consequences. A lot of complaining by the richer northerners about the lazy southerners. And with the central proposing authority proposing to remedy all of this by strengthening central authority at the expense of the member states. Now, last time Croatia faced such a decision was um, 1990. And Croatia uh, wasn't willing to submit its sovereignty to the, so the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, which actually had a lot more logical governing structures than the European Union does. Um, there's a point here, actually, because the economic consequences in the European Union have been rather disastrous for the southern countries of the European Union. Can you show me a member state of the European Union in the south that is in anything other than 1930s levels depression um, with severe political consequences and without... The, the, without the mechanisms, the authority, or the political power to get out of it. Why would Croatia want to go into that? Well, of course, um, uh, we are talking about uh, typical international relations dilemma. If you are joining European Union, are you increasing or decreasing your sovereignty? So basically, uh, we can discuss about that. Are you increasing or are you decreasing your sovereignty while you're joining European Union? Or is it federation? Should it be federation? Should it be some kind of confederation? I mean, those are just varieties uh, in, in approach. So, um, basically... Uh, well, it doesn't really matter because the European Commission is like the League of Communists of Yugoslavia. It decides policy, transmits it down, and you have the transmission belt theory, and then the member states are supposed to execute policy. But I don't see much democracy there. But there may be a real price for that because the economic consequences of Croatia joining Laura Hastings was actually you know, was was quite good, not actually, but was quite good. She is quite good as to what some of those downsides may be. And Croatia will not have uh, political authorities who can exercise uh, democratic political mechanisms to meet them. Is that likely to present problems for Croatia in the future, as it has been presenting problems? Noticeably for the Greeks and the Spanish and the Portuguese and potentially the Irish. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love the idea about symbolic politics and we're not the Balkans, we're part of Europe. But I got to tell you, you know, in the 1930s, being part of Central Europe was not all that great, right? Um, and uh, at the moment, it doesn't seem to be you know, being part of Southern Europe is all that great. Is this a good deal for Croatia? And are there real political dangers? Well, I think the question was directed at um, uh, Natasha, so we're going to let her uh, answer first then. I would say that it is basically uh, two parts of the same coin. 
I would say it is good for Croatia uh, to be under uh, some kind of patronage from European Commission. Uh, but on the other hand, I can argue as well that it isn't because they will uh, miss some of the uh, mechanisms for, uh, for, for their... Um, <coughs> I don't know, economic, uh, financial, monetary, et cetera, policy. So um, it, is, it is very relative issue, really, by my opinion. Um, and I'm still not sure whether it should be good or bad for, for Croatian government. I'm not still sure about that, really. It, there is also question, sorry, there is also a question. I mean, if you if, you, if you're joining the European Union, shall it, shall it increase your political power? Or shall it decrease your political power? I mean, basically, those are just different different approaches. So, yeah. I don't actually think they're unanswerable questions. Bob, I Bob, I, I love your question. I think it's it's fantastic. Uh, I just want to make sure that we don't conflate membership in the European Union with the global financial crisis. And your observation that the weaker, the poorer, the lesser developed countries suffer the greatest under financial crisis is not an EU, in my view, is not necessarily EU related. It's part of the, it's, it's part of the good Marxist critique of capitalism. That's what happens. Glo membership in the EU did allow these countries to borrow more than they otherwise would have which made them investors a, you know, a little bit more nervous about their sovereign debt crisis. But I would not then move forward and assume that if Croatia joins, they will necessarily suffer in the same way that Portugal, Spain, and Greece might have. Is that too, is that, is that, does that make sense? Could you expand on it a bit and, and tell us why? Okay, well, when there's a financial crisis, the, the, the poor, the weak, the, the lesser developed countries generally suffer more. That's, that, that's, that's a classic uh, observation of, of capitalist economics. So Bob was saying, these countries that joined the EU and now have, are doing so badly, I'm just worried, I'm just... Uh, want to make sure that we don't conflate EU membership with with uh, a global financial crisis, which is hurting these countries. Yes, Bob? Yeah, but, but the thing is, Laura, I mean, the reason the Greeks can't respond and the Portuguese can't respond and the Spanish can't respond is because of the restrictions put on them by European Union institutions, right, and by pressure from the European Union. Of course, membership in the euro in that regard is absolutely devastating. Um, so, you know, you, you, a poor country can actually do better if it, if it has some of the traditional tools of, of, of economic policy, which well, tell are Argentina up by that. the European Union. Yeah, no, are given up by entering the European Union and will be given up even more so by the changes that the Germans are insisting on the way the European Union operates. I'm not sure, Bob, I'm not sure that if they weren't members of the EU, they could do any better. Quite frankly, Argentina had a dr dramatic uh, uh, experience and it, they couldn't blame it on being part of a European Union. They just, you can't, small countries don't have a lot of resources when it comes to battling an economic crisis. I, I do grant you though, the EU membership did constrict, constrict there the numbers of different instruments they had at their disposal. But again, let's move forward with Croatia. Uh, it's not clear that membership in the EU at a time when there's a lot of scrutiny on EU finances, a lot of scrutiny on on, on, yeah, on, on public expenditures, it's not clear that Croatia will lose out as a result of that, as a result of membership. I'm going to actually, I see that there's another uh, member of your audience there, Laura, that wants to, that I think wants to add to the conversation. And we're actually hitting a point in the table where we would like to open up the uh, discussion to the broader uh, audience here. So let me do that right now. Yes, could you uh, please tell us who you are as well? Yes, hi. I'm Rochelle Bernazali from the Department of Geography here at the University of Illinois. And I spent last academic year in Croatia on a Fulbright doing my dissertation research. And um, I just wanted to um, 
make a quick comment um, regarding what Professor Hayden was saying, which I think is such an important question, um, the idea of, of sovereignty. I went into the field expecting to hear so much about this from my respondents, and I didn't until I would press them on it. And the impression that I really left Croatia with was that um, to, to ask this very legitimate question at all was completely derided in the public dialogue about EU accession. Um, and I had the feeling that so many of my respondents actually do harbor concerns about sovereignty in just the ways that Professor Hayden was saying, um, except that if you bring that up, if you try to voice it, you're immediately put in the camp of the uninformed, the provincial, the right wing, perhaps, that sort of thing. So that was just an observation that I wanted to share from my field work. Thank you. Other comments from uh, other audiences, or actually, I think Dominique has been trying to get a, a word in here for a second here. So let's let's let Dominique uh, uh, say something first here. Thank you. Yeah, just just one one quick remark on this uh, discussion we had just earlier. Um, I think we, we shouldn't confuse like EU membership with being member in the, in the eurozone, and Croatia is far from being member in the eurozone. Um, so here, like the, the example of Greece, Spain, Portugal, etc., that have been mentioned, that has only been possible because they have been members of the eurozone, which gives the European Central Bank and the Eurogroup such a leverage on this kind of countries. But in Croatia, the, the case is different because as long as you're not a member of the, the eurozone, you don't have to fear this kind of central control by Frankfurt or um, the European Council, whatever, um, um, in whatever way. So, like, maybe, like, the thing is more like EU membership means, uh, like, having this kind of uh, uh, market system introduced. So the only thing that Croatia could do to, to prevent, like, control from Brussels would be to, to protect its market and not entering the single market. But, like, uh, I think, like, having, like, this kind of central control by Frankfurt uh, on how to do, like, um, currency issues, etc. That is a completely different issue, which shouldn't be like confused with EU membership. Thank you. Can I ask a question, please? Uh, do you think, Professor, that uh, Greece should be in better position if they withdrew from Eurozone and they will be back in Drachma? What would be their position on financial market? Should it be in better position than they are at the moment or not? Greece has no better position. <laughs> no, I mean, if you look at the if you look at the level of devastation that is Greek on Greece, there is no better position. The public health, the mortality, the morbidity statistics are going up tragically. We were hearing a report this morning on National Public Radio. Greeks are burning, burning down national forests to stay uh, to stay warm. The levels of pollution, which are already pretty high in Athens, are going up tragically. Um, you know, for Greece, the adventure with uh, at least, and Dominic's right on this, is the difference between the, Euro, the Eurozone and the European Union. Greece's adventure with the Euro has been a, an unmitigated disaster. And uh, most of the analyses would indicate that uh, an exit from the Euro would have immediate, even more strongly negative consequences, after which time, if Greece survives, um, Greece might start to get better. Will Greece survive anyway? The rise of Golden Dawn and the fascist party in Greece is very scary and perfectly predictable. I mean, what we've known from the 1920s and 1930s onwards, if you want to facilitate fascism, you create mass poverty and unemployment. And this is precisely what European Union policies have been doing in Greece and what they may be doing in, uh, in Spain. You know, somebody, uh, Laura referred earlier to Argentina, says small countries uh, don't, uh, don't do well. Spain is not a small country. Italy is not a small country. These are not small countries. They are not small economies. And their economies and their societies are being absolutely devastated by Eurozone and policies and European Union policies. Um, and I really can't for the life of me figure out why Croatia uh, would want to join the Southerners. Okay? It becomes part of Europe, but it becomes part of the Southerners. Now, I go back long enough to, uh, in the former Yugoslavia, to remember when the Slovenes were calling everybody else at U. Everybody else, they were huge Nazi Southerners. Uh, 
uh, and that was a term of, uh, of opprobrium, which it is now in the European Union. Uh, so that Croatia gets a, a second-class membership in a in a club that is being restructured and not Croatia's advantage. I uh, I find this hard to to fathom. Okay. <laughs> now I would continue with questions, but nevertheless, please. <laughs> This is I nice. Still, yeah. Okay. Wanted to still keep the floor open to um, our broader audience here for other questions and comments, um, if we could. Um, any any other audience uh, members who would like to contribute? Hi everyone. I uh, my name is Alejandra Aguero, and I'm a doctoral student in the College of Education. My major is Global Studies and Education, and I'm also the Assistant Director of Graduate Admissions for the College of Business. Um, my question is in regards to the educational system of Croatia. What can you tell us about its uh, educational system as far as alignment with the Bologna Declaration, the 1999 Bologna Declaration? Can I? Uh, Natasha, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, hmm. Uh, problem with Bologna process in in Croatia is that it was um, implemented uh, without um, any coordinate, uh, coordination, without any cooperation with universities, professors, representatives of students, etc. Uh, one day it was just there. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, consequences of Bologna process in uh, in Croatia are quite ridiculous. Um, instead of preparing students for uh, instead of preparing students for uh, market, uh, they formed um, so many um, titles that does not mean a thing to 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 uh, business business in in Croatia. And instead of a uh, decreasing number of studying basically uh, it it, um, it it enlarged process of uh, studying so basically if you are for example um, on a three year study it doesn't mean a thing for 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 market you need to be at faculty at least for five years um, so um, we do, do not consider that it was um, successful in any term. And um, okay, maybe in um, providing ECTS um, or uh, maybe providing some uh, conditions for mobility, but uh, none of the um, advantages of Bologna process were, uh, were uh, implemented in, in Croatia and so far, after five years of, of that process. We have a question or a comment from the audience uh, here in Pittsburgh. Hi, my name is Jess Kuntz. I actually did my Fulbright in Croatia the year before Rochelle, so hi Rochelle. Um, but I, I think you're correct in saying that the payoffs of EU membership are fewer than they were perceived as being when the EU st when <coughs> Croatia started this process, and I think the decline amongst Croatian popular opinion is kind of reflective of that. Um, the question that I wanted to pose to the panel really concerns public opinion in Croatia's neighbors. Why do you think looking at Croatia, knowing that the money is not necessarily there, that the trade-offs are perhaps greater than the benefits that they're going to gain from formally ascending to the EU, why do you think the EU has maintained this really high levels of pu public appeal in Bosnia, in, well, Kosovo is a different case, but in Serbia, in kind of the former countries of the Yugoslavia that are further away from EU membership? Why does it remain yet so appealing in spite of reality? Dominique, would you like to uh, comment on that? Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, I don't, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I really uh, completely understood the question, but if I understood correctly, like the question was about why how is the appeal of the European Union still in the in Serbia, Bosnia, etc. that high, right? There's such an attractive of the European Union still in the in the countries. Yeah, that was yeah, the right. Yeah, why the continued appeal outside of yeah. Croatia to their neighbors? Well, I, I, I would say it's it's decreasing, isn't it? I mean, the people look at the European Union, they hear about the euro crisis, they hear about all these kind of problems, uh, economic problems in, in, in Europe. And I would say like the... Um, enthusiasm for membership is really decreasing in the region. Um, well, you have to tell me because you're from the region. 
But um, uh, like if you also if you looked at Croatia, like the enthusiasm for EU membership has been quite high. If you if you look at uh, opinion polls ten years ago, but nowadays um, it, it's really low. Uh, I would say. So that will be the same for Serbia, Bosnia, etc. And um, in addition, like especially for Bosnia, I would say the membership perspective is so far away that people really don't really believe that in their generation they 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 will attain membership. Um, and this is why also like this states a little bit the position of the European Commission at the moment that really, really tries to foster um, the pre-accession process with Bosnia, although there's not really any any um, um, advancements in, in the pre-accession process. If you look at constitutional reform, etc., the European Union nowadays much more flexible in these kind of conditions set in this on this topic. So here you can really see that Stefan Fühle uh, and the European Commission are really trying to foster like the membership perspective of Bosnia in order to give the people some kind of hope, I would say, uh, and to get some kind of reforms in the end. Uh, but still, it's, it will be difficult to uh, convince the people that they will get the membership uh, in 10 years or something because they also see the enlargement fatigue in the European Union. They see the population in, um, in Germany, in Netherlands, etc. that are very much anti-accession uh, uh, anti at the moment. Um, so I think these factors uh, contribute to the fact that um, the membership uh, enthusiasm is uh, really decreasing in the region as well. Thank you. If I could um, interject a question in here at that, that point, then um, it's yes. I mean, if you look at the the public opinion trends in the region, uh, support for the EU is is on a decrease. And if you look at the trend in Croatia, um, basically um, support for the European Union was very high until the end of, end of 2003, after which it essentially the two sides switched uh, locations on the graph. Basically, you you plunged into um, well, 40% of the population consistently um, supporting and then the other remainder um, either uh, being against membership or trust, depending upon what the question was, or indifferent. Yet at the same time, none of the political parties in Croatia seem to track that change in public opinion. Um, it seemed to me that it would have been a pretty good bet in 2004 for a small party to decide to take on a Eurosceptic platform. Uh, why didn't that happen? Because I think we're about to see the same trend in Serbia as well. So, sorry, what was the question? I didn't hear. Sorry, I apologize. Why, does, why haven't the political parties in Croatia, now it seems in Serbia, been sort of tracking this change in, in public opinion towards a more sort of uh, skeptical attitude towards towards Europe? Well, um... Or, or sh short, why don't we have a Eurosceptic party in, in, Europe, in, in the Balkans anymore? Yes, uh, that, that is an interesting question. We also ask ourselves the same question because uh, there is core of population that is Eurosceptic. And the question is, why has not been um, anybody's political agenda in terms to form political party on that program? Um, in Croatia, the case is that basically all political parties uh, had consensus that European Union, European <coughs> entering is uh, priority, a national national priority, and um, basically the most important um, foreign affairs goals. And uh, in in Croatia Parliament, we have several declarations that European Union, and it was supported by all political parties, that European Union is definitely the only agenda in, in, in Croatia. Uh, but um, unfortunately, that political party uh, party's attitude is totally in clash with um, Croatian citizens. Uh, attitude. There, there, there are several reasons for that. Uh, first reason is, of course, um, that whole accession process was very closed for Croatian public. Um, that um, uh, negotiation process was completely untransparent, uh, very uh, distant from, from Croatian uh, citizens. They were not part of it in any way. Um, second thing is, um, uh, Euroscepticism in Croatia is uh, mostly determined by a uh, situation on ICTY. So basically, uh, when uh, General Gotovina was um, sent to prison, uh, it was the lowest. It was the lowest level for support of European Union, um, and that Euroscepticism is uh, 
in most in most uh, ways uh, determined by uh, unrational in very emotional uh, uh, matters. Um, what else? Um, uh, in Croatia, there is uh, maybe because it is relatively um, a young young national state. There is general threat uh, general threat to a nation. Uh, fear that um, Croatian independence, sovereignty, politi politics, culture should be jeopardized by, by European Union. Um, and these are all, um, these are the, all indicators uh, that influenced on, on the opinion of Croatian, uh, Croatian uh, people, quite contrary to a uh, program of, of political parties. Hi, Laura Hastings here. I just, I, I'm thinking as we're going back and forth at this, how interesting uh, European Union conditionality or political conditionality has been in in this region, um, uh, and and thinking that in part uh, among Croats that I knew and spoke with, this notion that joining the EU will assure that there's the kind of political development of parties and political um, maturity of parties um, during this, during what is a tra democratic transition. Uh, you know, this notion that if we join the EU, our, our, our politicians can't be corrupt, or if we join the EU, they're going to be more accountable politically. So in this regard, um, EU conditionality, while it's been really highly debated in a lot of uh, a lot of regions in the last decade may be playing a positive role in Croatia. I don't know though. I would confirm that, yeah. I would confirm that um, EU conditionality played extremely uh, positive role in uh, reforms and changes uh, for all aspects of, of uh, political, economic, cultural, human rights, whatever, uh, in all aspects of, of, of life in Croatia. Uh, in Croatia, that was the case. Your conditionality is definitely a success story, success story in Croatia. Definitely, yeah. Um, quickly, um, Laura, one, one, one thing. So essentially, you're saying they're looking for a savior to save them from themselves. If they join the European Union, they won't have politicians like more, maybe Silvia Berlusconi, right? Um, or something, yeah. They'll be saved from that. Um, but two things. Uh, look, the European Union is a purely elite project, and uh, the idea that European Union treaties would be put up to referenda is rejected by everybody running the European Union, because the European Union, frankly, is not popular among its own citizens. And uh, the European Union has gone down on referenda on several occasions, and it's not something that can be risked to the people because the people don't understand it. But it's interesting that we're talking about Euroscepticism in the Balkans. Can we talk about Euroscepticism in Britain? When we have the Prime Minister of Britain threatening to leave the European Union and the U.S. government threatening the Prime Minister of Britain for threatening to leave the European Union? I mean, this is not actually... The, I'll put it this way. No one has written convincingly about the uh, democratic surplus of the European Union. Democratic deficit is another question. Mm. Another question from the audience uh, here in Pittsburgh, Marina. Um, my name is Marina Antic. I am a, a PhD candidate at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, and, and I know it's going to sound weird, comparative literary and cultural studies, but I do dabble a little bit in history. And I have a couple of comments, actually. Um, I would say that in this uh, exchange we've had before between Professor Hayden and um, um, Professor Hastings and Bashirovich, we've uh, on the question of you know whether European membership or EU is going to be economically beneficial or not. I think what's missing from that argument is the fact that we are talking about in terms of. Uh, even if it's not on Euro, in terms of Croatian accession to the EU, we're talking about a more complete integration into the global capitalist structure. Hence, Argentina is not going to do as well. Um, but the same process is actually at play, meaning that there is a, an issue with how peripheral southern countries do in a global capitalist system in its current incarnation when the central countries are really trying to save themselves. 
And I think uh, um, in terms of uh, the popular sentiment in Croatia, I think that uh, that it seems to me, at least from the outside, I haven't been in Croatia in a few years, that um, the, the anti-European sentiment there is, is also very interestingly an anti-capitalist sentiment. Um, and it seems like in the Greek case for good reason. And I think it, for the Greeks, it would be a good idea to take uh, uh, the advice of the Yugoslav Communist Party, if they could, if they could, you know, give them the advice today, meaning um, it's better to default than pay off all your debts and fall apart as a state, which is what happened to Yugoslavia. And just one, one last thing on why there is no anti-European uh, um, um, parties in Croatia or anywhere in the Balkans anymore that are viable. I think there is. Uh, despite all of my comments that you know that are just delivered on uh, you know global capitalism, I think there is still a fact that there is no Soviet Union. There is no other option. So yes, okay. So let's say you are you are a Croatian who does not want to join the European Union. What are your other options? You can stand by yourself and be in an even worse economic position. So yeah, European Union or rather global capital structures are the only game in town. So that's that's sort of my take. And that is the option. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Prime Minister of Turkey is plugging a, a lira zone, but he hasn't had any more <laughs> Well, after that, on that stirring endorsement uh, of, of EU membership, um, I wanted to thank everybody who had come, uh, who has come to uh, participate in the event today. Uh, I think it's been a very useful um, discussion for us all. I think some interesting questions were like, raised on a, on a broad range of uh, different issues, and I'm sure we'll all be looking ahead to July 1st um, to see how the accession process ends and um, where things go after that. So thank you all.